أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم فعنا بما علمت اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا أرحم الراحمين ويا الله teach us what benefits us and benefit us from what you teach us and purify our souls. You are the best to purify them. O oh, Ya Allah, give us the taqwa and place it deep in our hearts so that we are always mindful of you and we're always observing you and your uh, greatness in all our lives, Ya Allah. My dear brothers and sisters, I will talk, inshallah, for these few minutes about the concept of Haqqullah and Haqqul al-Ibad, the concept of the right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon us and our duty to our fellow uh, creation, humans, the entire existence, the entire creation. Remember that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved, was sent as a mercy to the entire creation. So, in order to put things in perspective, one has to think about the purpose of our creation. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us humans? Why did he place us on this earth? And we find the answer, of course, in the Quran. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to us and saying, we have only, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only created the jinn and the humans in order to, for us to worship him. So what is the concept of worship? What does that mean? Worship is a comprehensive word that includes anything that we do in our life that is according to the teachings of Allah and the sunnah of the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with the intent to please Allah and to follow his command. Yani al-ibadah or the, the, the worship is very comprehensive. Everything that we do in our life can be worship. We're going to work, studying, smiling in the face of our brothers and sisters, doing sadaqah, doing anything, studying, learning something new, spending time with our family. This can all be a form of worship or a form of ibadah, in addition, of course, to the core concept of ibadah, which is dhikr, salah, hajj, sawm, zakah, and so on. So if we look at it this way, now everything begins to make sense because the creation, our purpose of creation is to worship Allah. And we are in, in, the, in the acts of worship, meaning salah and siyam and hajj and, and so on, only a, a small fraction of our life. So what, is the, what about the rest of the, our life? The entire life that we live can be a form of ibadah if we have the correct niyyah and if we follow the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so some of the scholars divide ibadah into two general categories. One, they call it al-ibadah al-sha'airiyya, the ritual act of worship. That, of course, is very obvious to all of us. Salah, siyam, hajj, zakah, and so on and so forth. And the other kind of ibadah is al-ibadah al-ta'amuliyya, the way or the worship in dealing with others dealing with other fellow human beings, dealing with the entire creation, dealing with animals, dealing with the environment. This is all a part of the al-ibadah al-ta'amuliyya or the ibadah that is transactional or dealing with uh, um, other fellow creation. So al-ibadah is, is all so important this is the purpose of our life but these two forms of ibadah are not separate they are very well connected 
Like if I smile in my brother's face, I am making him feel better. I'm making him feel more comfortable. And I'm worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hoping that Allah will give me a reward for this. So I cannot just turn my face away from my brother or look at him and frown because I am busy and saying, you know what, that's okay. I'm, I'm just going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me. But I just hurt his feelings. I just hurt my brother's feelings. So where does, how does that fit? Right? When we, we learn from the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, and the seerah of the Sahaba عليهم, in understanding this, how these two forms of ibadah are related. The Prophet وسلم, was reported to have said, لَأَنْ أَمْشِيَ فِي حَاجَةِ أَخِي أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ أَنْ أَعْتَكِفَ فِي مَسْجِدِ هَذَا شَهْرًا In, For me to walk along or walk in order or go try to provide service or fulfill the need of my brother لَأَنْ أَمْشِيَ فِي حَاجَةِ أَخِي is more beloved to me, to the Prophet وسلم, than doing i'tikaf, staying in the masjid. Remember, he does the masjid in Nabawi for a month. That is more beloved to the heart of the Prophet وسلم, to go and help a brother, help a, a person in order to fulfill a need than to, uh, uh, it's more beloved to him than to do ibadah in the masjid. Of course, when we, when we have plenty of time, we can do both. But just to put things in perspective. Yani, for example, if we take the, 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 the action of the Sahaba, عليهم, Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi was visiting, radiallahu anhu was visiting Sayyidina Abi, Abu Darda, two great Sahaba, right? So he's visiting him and spending, you know, he decided to visit his brother, for the love and for the sake of Allah and to you know spend the night with him so the long story I'll just take the part that will illustrate what I'm talking about is that when they you know uh, uh, food was brought to Sayyidina Salman by Abu Darda's you know wife and she brought the food and then Abu Darda says go ahead tfaddal eat. And then he said, how about you? He said, I'm fasting. Of course, it wasn't the Ramadan. It was the Siyam al-Tatawwa, Siyam al-Nafila, right? So Sayyidina Salman said, no, you have to eat with me. I'm not eating without, without you. Break your fast and eat with me. So Abu Darda was, and of course, he's such a good host. So he listened to his, his brother and he ate with him. But then he decided, no, you know what? I, I listened to you, you told me to sleep and not to pray the whole night, you told me to eat with you, you told me some other things. Let's go to the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and ask him. So they went and then told him the story. And then our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sadaqa Salman, Salman is correct, Salman is right, that you actually should fulfill. And he said, in your body has a right over you, your guest has a right upon you, your wife has a right upon you, and of course, first and foremost, Allah has a right upon you. And give each of them their due or their right. So Sayyidina Abu Darda was thinking he was pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by fasting, but Salman radiallahu anhu told him, you know, indirectly that this is, again, you're, you're welcoming me to your house and eating with me is also pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's on the positive side, doing things to our brothers or for our brothers and sisters and our community, you know, that even beyond human beings. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us the, 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 the story of one story for was a man and the other one was a woman. And the woman was not actually known to be like good. She was actually doing something, you know, very bad in her life and so on. But they, she saw a dog that was almost about to die out of thirst. And she went into the well and got some water and gave this dog a, 
you water to drink. The Prophet ﷺ said Allah forgave her for all the bad things that she was doing and he granted her Jannah for her mercy. And the man was the same thing, walking in the desert. The dog was almost dying of thirst, did the same thing, and then gave the dog some water. And the Prophet ﷺ said Allah forgave him for that and granted him Jannah. Just for extending our khair, extended our mercy, extending our rahmah to our fellow creation. So you can imagine now that, you know, if you have some extra time and you're so busy, you want to sit down and read Quran, for example, and okay, this is now the time I'm going to have, this hour is for me, and I'm going to read, sit and read Quran and do dhikr or maybe pray and so on and so forth. Your brother calls you and says, you know, I, I'm really stuck. I, you know, my car broke down and I don't know, I will have to be somewhere. What would you do? What is more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this case is to say, of course, I'm going to come and pick you up and take you where you want to go. Rather than, oh no, I'm busy because you want to sit by yourself and enjoy the khalwa, enjoy the, you know, to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reading the Quran. Because when you go and help your brother, you are indeed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that says now the haqqullah and haqq al-ibad. It, it only works in the opposite when you've, we violate the rights of other human beings or other uh, uh, creator, creation. Like for example, our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa once sitting with his sahaba, al-kiram radiallahu anhum, and he asked them, atadruna man al-muflis? Do you know who is the real like bankrupt, someone who is penniless, someone who has nothing. Al muflis means someone who is who doesn't have anything, who doesn't own anything. So they answer, they say, Ya Rasulullah, Al Muflis Ufina, you know, the one we consider penniless or muflis is the one that has no money, has no wealth, no no property, no nothing, nothing of this dunya. That's the most obvious answer. When he asks somebody who is a person that you consider a bankrupt person, it's like, oh, someone who doesn't have money. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to teach them a very important lesson, and he said, no. Al-Muflis, man ata yawm al that the real bankrupt person, the loser, the real loser, al billah, is someone who comes on the Day of Judgment with tons of salah and zakah, and siyam, and on the opposite side with all that, you can imagine, mountains of hasanat, of doing good deeds. But then he came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having insulted that person, having accused another person falsely, shahadat al-zur, al-a'adhu billah, or qadf, having hurt the one, somebody physically, shed his blood or hurt him physically or having slandered someone like talked behind somebody's back or having taken some money of this person and not returned it or kind of tricked him into something and stole his money then the prophet sallallahu said then all these people whom he had hurt in this life are going to get a share of his hasanat. You know, these mountains now start getting smaller and smaller until they are nothing. There's nothing left, but his debt hasn't been paid yet. So what happens is that their sayyat, their bad deeds will be taken away from them and put, put on his scale until he's doomed. That's a very, very scary warning from our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. يَأْتِ أَحَدُهُمْ بِجِبَالٍ مِنْ الْحَسَنَاتِ صِيَامْ صِيَامْ زَكَاة And, you know, صدقة, everything, but he has a debt that has to pay. And because he didn't pay that, he didn't 
clear himself from this debt in this life, then as the account has to close, then the account is closed on the day of judgment by what is the currency in the day of judgment. We here, we have, you know, we have different currencies. We have dollars and pounds and cents and all this is how people are dealing in transactions in this life. In the hereafter, there is a currency. But this currency is what? The currency is hasanat and sayyat, na'udhu billah. Good deeds, bad deeds. Now people exchange, and it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to determine how much is enough. When Sayyidina al-Hasan al-Basri, one of the great scholars in Tabi'een, he heard someone who was slandering him in public, and you know, he heard that he is, this, this person is really, you know, always talking bad about al-Hasan al-Basri. So he, he did a very good gesture. He got, you know, some dessert, some sweets, and he sent it to this man with a, with a nice message saying, I heard that you have given me some of your hasanat as a gift, so I'm returning the favor. So here's some sweets. So, <laughs> so of course, you know, like, very nice way of making also da'wah to this person, and like, realize what you are doing, right? So here's, <laughs> I'm, I'm repaying the favor. Um, so let's, let's think in... in more in, um, in our daily life, or before that, you know, we're talking about salah and siyam and so on. The Prophet ﷺ specifically said in, about siyam, inshallah, we're going to be fasting in, 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 a, in a little more than, you know, or less than, th than two months, inshallah, we're going to be fasting Ramadan. الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم said من لم يدع قول الزور والعمل به فليس لله حاجة في أن يدع طعامه وشرابه it means whoever does not stop from saying falsehood and accusing others a zur a zur is, is one of the major major the, the worst major sins is actually to give false testimony and get someone else in trouble or get someone else punished for something they didn't do false testimony is the, one of the things that nothing Nothing helps with, nothing will save someone on the day of judgment if they come to have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having said something or having given false testimony to hurt someone, someone else. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever does not stop actually saying zur or giving false testimony or such bad behavior, there is no need Allah does not need him to fast. Allah does not need him to stop eating or drinking. What's the point? So that's the, the, the meaning of the hadith. What's the point? Because he hurt someone else by talking zur, by giving false accusation, then Allah does not need his siyam. It doesn't benefit him anymore. مَن لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ فِي أَنْ يَدْعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَبَهُ so let's think in terms of very simple acts, very simple daily things. Some people say, you know, I'm going to come to you at 5 o'clock. And they give you, this is a promise, right? Whether you say I promise or not, I'm coming to you at 5 o'clock. It means you should expect me there at 5 o'clock. Maybe, you know, I, maybe I'll get in too many red lights or whatever. So maybe I'll be a couple of minutes late. But... I shouldn't show up at like six or seven and say, you know, there's no big deal. You know, I mean, even, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the salah, you know, there is, a, there is a range of time, right? We can be late for salat al dhuhr and just pray before asr and say, yani even if you remember to say, ya Allah, please forgive me for being late. And khalas, inshallah, you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ghafoorun rahim. But the, the, the situation is very different. The situation is that in, in حقوق Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, things that are exclusively and completely between us and Allah, when we don't, when we fall short, we pray to Allah and say, Ya oh Allah, please, I, for, you know, I, I seek your forgiveness. I, I will try to do my best to do better and so on. Please, Ya Allah, forgive me. But if I don't give my brother his rights to show up on time, or to give him whatever money that I had borrowed from him, 
or if I harm him in any other way, it doesn't work in the same way that I pray to Allah. I say, yeah, Allah, forgive me for stealing a hundred dollar from this man. It doesn't work like that. Then, as the, 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 the scholars say, الْأَصْلُ فِي حُدُودِ فِي فِي حُقُوقِ اللَّهِ الْمُسَامَحَةِ That when you, and we, are all, we all fall short, right? كُلُّ بْنِ آدَمَ خَطَّاءَ We all are really, um, we fall short in, in, in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can never give him his due. And we ask for forgiveness. But in حُقُوقِ العباد, the scholars also, the scholars here say, وَالْأَصْلُ فِي حُقُوقِ الْعِبَادِ الْمُشَاحَةِ that we really have to make sure that we give people and we give the, you know, anyone else, we give them their due, we give them their right. We don't violate them. We don't violate the rights of human beings. We don't even violate the rights of animals. Because while I told you about the two stories with, with the man and the woman being granted, you know, a Jannah for giving water to, to, to uh, dogs, there is a woman that was thrown in the hellfire because she locked up or tied up a cat. And this cat was not allowed to go out and, and fetch for itself. And she did not give her or give it, the cat, any kind of food. Can you imagine that? Because there's no mercy in their heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept that this cat is a creation of Allah and should be treated with mercy. And therefore, if someone knowingly do this, then they can be, وَالْعَيَاذُ billah expelled from the, the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's, it's, it's really important. And therefore, when, when the ulama, when they say how to, how to perform tawbah, if someone is, وَالْعَيَاذُ billah committing sins, small or major of course the small sins every day we do the salah and we do the adhkar and we do the istighfar and so on and so forth so all these sagair, all these small small sins inshallah they will as long as we continue doing salah and zikr and come to jum'ah and and pray and give sadaqah and so all of these are inshallah will be wiped off however for the major sins they require a specific tawbah Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I promise you that I, you know, will no longer do this and you know, this, this sin, wal'adhu billah. And they say, first of all, you have to regret it. You have to insist on not doing it. You have to do your best on not doing it again. And even if you fall into it, back into it, then you go turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for istighfar. And this, hopefully, that Allah will give, you, give us the tawbah from that sin. However, when the sin is linked to a violation of another person's right, then there is an additional ruknur, or an additional uh, uh, factor here that has to be fulfilled. I have to give back that person his right. If I had borrowed money from someone and I, I was able to pay it and I didn't pay it and I didn't apologize for if I'm not, if I'm not able and so on, I have to go and pay it to him. What if the person has died? Find his, find his, uh, his family, his waratha, and, and, and pay that. Say, I had a, a debt to your father or mother that was this much. Here it is. Please forgive me. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Now, if nothing of that can be done, then take this money out of yours, of your money, because it's not yours, and go and put it somewhere in, in charity. Give it to the masjid. Give it to some... But, of course, you have to do your best to find the man or the person from whom you had borrowed this money. We're thinking about different things that are very relevant in our daily life. For example, someone is late for Jum'ah. Oh, I'm late for Jum'ah. I'm just going to park and block the driveway of the, you know, the person. And, you know, it's not a big deal. It's going to be five minutes or ten minutes. But I want to come for Jum'ah. I'm going to block that person's car or driveway. No, it doesn't work this way. Go back. Go home. If you can't park legally and not harm anyone else, go home. And then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Because you, now you, you, it's between you and Allah. You tried to come to the masjid, you couldn't. Because you were not unable to find a ride or don't violate other people's rights and saying, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. 
We see all the, 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 the news and all the, the warnings about, you know, the coronavirus and the flu season and everything. Someone is having a flu and they're coughing and sneezing and aching and have fever. And they feel guilty for not coming to the masjid and they come for Jum'ah and they ended up, you know, one person can make 10 people sick. Tell me that is not violating hukuk al-abad. That is. It's much better to stay home and say, Allah, forgive me. I, I really, my, my sincere intention was to go to Jum'ah, but I can't because I'm sick and I don't want to get other people sick. Allah will not only, inshallah, yani, Allah will not only forgive you, but he will reward you for your niyyah and he will reward you additionally for not wanting to harm other people. That is how it is. That is how it should work. You know, so therefore nowadays with all this scare about the coronavirus and we're also in the flu season and all, do, do your own judgment. Use your judgment to actually, you know, what is better? Come to the masjid and expose someone else to my illness or stay home and ask Allah for forgiveness. Based on all what we've been talking about in this khutbah, in this discussion, very, you know, in, in this talk, no, it is much better to avoid harming other people and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And that is, يعني, that is how, inshallah, you'll get even more reward than actually, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to give like a, a blanket type of fatwa here, but if you come to the masjid knowing that you're going to harm others by being sick, tell me this is not a sin. It is a sin. If you know you're going to get other people sick and you, intend, you intentionally come, don't do it. Just simply stay home and say, Allah, forgive me. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the most forgiving. He is the most forgiving. We can't even imagine how forgiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. How forgiving, you know, the, 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 how merciful and forgiving the Prophet sallallahu was with his people when they when they committed a, 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 you know, something that was between them and Allah. There are so many stories in the seerah. We don't have time. We're almost out of time here. But this man, somehow he came to the Prophet Sallallahu feeling that he was doomed because he did something. He broke his fast intentionally. During the, the month of Ramadan, he broke his fast and had a relationship with his, with his wife during the day where he was, of course, should not have. And then he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, I'm doomed. You know, I'm, I, I don't know what to do. So he told him what he has to do. He said, you know what? You have to pay for, to free a, a, to free a neck or free, free a slave. I have no money to pay. So, okay, feed 60, 60 miskeen, feed, you know, 60 people. Well, I, I don't even have that. See, Prophet ﷺ gave him a whole you know, branch of, of dates. And he said, take this and feed it to the poor. Then the man looked at the dates and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I am the poorest man. And the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, see how merciful and forgiving he is. He says, take this and feed it to yourself and your family. May Allah forgive you. So he came to the Prophet thinking he was doomed because he did something really, really bad that no one should do. And he ended up going, going home with a, a whole branch of dates, subhanAllah. But that is how, you know, forgiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always make us, help us to, to, to really understand where, where we are in this life and where we are in, in His sight, because this is the most important. We're thinking, when we, don't, when we say don't violate the, the, the rights of, of, of other creation, it is to improve our own standing in the sight of, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروه آخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين.